Okay. Welcome to the Prince George's County Historical Society's April 24th, 2023 History Chat. I'm Donna Schneider, President of the Historical Society. We are celebrating Maryland Archaeology Month this, the, tonight with Prince George's County Senior Archaeologist Stephanie Sperling, who's chatting with John Peter Thompson about digging for history, collection, content, and context. We are recording the chat and would appreciate you muting your microphones. The chat will be posted on our YouTube channel, which can be accessed through our website, www.pghistory.org. And let me... Um, we will take questions at the end of the chat. You can put all questions in our chat box, please. Um, and we will get to as many of these as possible when we, um, uh, at the end of the chat. A little something about our, our guests. Stephanie Sperling currently serves as senior archaeologist for the Department of Parks and Recreation in Prince George's County, where she also manages Mount Calvert Historical and Archaeological Park. She holds a BA in anthropology from Pennsylvania State University and a master of applied anthropology and a certificate in historic preservation from the University of Maryland. For the past 20 plus years, Stephanie has held positions in the public, private and nonprofit sectors and directed excavations on countless sites, including ancient, ancient indigenous villages, colonial towns and early American plantations. She routinely designs innovative public programs that encourage preservation and civic engagement. Please welcome Stephanie. It's all yours, John Peter. Thank you very much. And thank you, Stephanie, for agreeing to spend an hour with the Historical Society and talking about archeology. span And I, I suppose I should start with, I think this is archeology span month. Is that true? It is. April is Archaeology Month. Happy Archaeology Month. Ah, uh, so this is this is a good time to talk about archaeology. And, and having just heard uh, all the things that you've been doing for so long, I think I want to start with what do you do with the Parks Department or what does an archaeologist do and what do you do specifically in Prince George's County? Um, I mean, well, let me start with a funny story about what I typically do not do, um, which is dig dinosaurs. So <laughs> it is a very common uh, misperception that archaeologists dig dinosaurs. I have spent the better part of my career uh, trying to convince people that that is paleontology. So I am an archaeologist. Uh, I'm trained as an anthropologist. Anthropology is a study of culture. And archaeology is a study of past cultures based on the stuff that people leave behind. So it's basically their garb. We dig through people's trash from a long time ago, but it's much cooler than that. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, so paleontologists, on the other hand, are trained as biologists or um, geologists studying um, the ancient fossil record. Now, I say that this is a funny story because today, I dug a dinosaur bone <laughs> for, the first, for the first time in my adult life. I dug a dinosaur bone. I was the paleontologist for the day because we, one of the things that we do in Prince George's uh, Parks and Recreation is we manage Dinosaur Park. So Dinosaur Park is a paleontological park. It is in Laurel. And uh, they are, you know, when the park system acquired Dinosaur Park, you know, 10, 15 years ago, they were like, well, of course the archaeologists should manage it because that's what they do, right? It's like, no, not at all, but okay, sure. Um, so the paleontologist that works at Dinosaur Park has a new program uh, where you can actually go out and help him dig for fossils. Usually they just surface collect, but you can actually help him dig. And they have been excavating what they think is the a long bone of a of a meat eating dinosaur from the late Cretaceous. And he has to get this thing out of there before the storms come in this weekend. So I went out and dug a dinosaur bone. But that is not usually <laughs> what I ever do. So so in your normal course of business here in Prince George's County, when you're digging for culture and history and archaeology do you ever run a do you ever dig deep enough to maybe find dinosaur bones no we no. really don't because this you know the, the the people layers the stuff that i'm interested in is in maybe the top 
one, two, three feet of soil at the at the outside. It's not far beneath uh, beneath the ground surface. You know, at Dinosaur Park, and when you're talking about the paleontological records, you know, you have to go pretty deep for that, or out of like an eroding bank if you're at like a place like Calvert Cliffs, and maybe you're finding um, shark's teeth that are eroding out. So no, we stay a whole lot closer to the ground surface than than paleontologists do. I did find a dinosaur bone once on a site that I dug on the Patuxent River. It was a uh, a native village, um, and we found a, a dinosaur fossil. But it was the native people had probably found it and brought it there. I, I would speculate, not being an archaeologist, that when you are um, digging for the past that you do, however, come up with assorted animal bones and, and things of that nature, right? I mean, the more current kind of things that may have uh, wound up where humans were. I mean, I, I would assume things like shark teeth. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, the, um, the indigenous people that lived here, um, they are, you know, for thousands of years, and we're talking ancient history here, but they, um, you know, they picked up shark's teeth. We find shark's teeth on, um, on in their village sites. Um, I was, I dug a site once over by Fairhaven on the Chesapeake Bay in Southern Anne Arundel County. It was a shell midden, a shell heap, you know, where the, uh, the native people went about two or 3,000 years ago, and they were collecting oysters and, and gathering them. And then they just dump all of their shells into one pile, but then they also put other stuff in that trash pile, um, like their pottery and, um, you know, their stone tools and bones, other things they were eating, like deer and other, you know, fish and turtles and that sort of thing. But we did find they had collected some fossils, um, fossilized shells, because that's close to the Calvert Formation, you know, so that's where you go when you collect, you know, fossils there on, on, the, on the bay. And they had gotten some of these fossilized clamshells and made stone tools, made projectile points and scrapers out of them. That was pretty cool, very unusual. So as an archeologist, finding the remain, animal remains, that tells you something about the people that inhabited the area that you're working in, I would presume. It certainly does, right. And diet is, is a really important um, research question that we have. Um, for example, you know, um, at the top, we were talking about uh, at Mount Calvert. I managed Mount Calvert Historical and Archaeological Park. And Mount Calvert is uh, right on the Patuxent River, kind of near, um, it's sort of uh, in the Jug Bay area of the Patuxent River in, in Prince George's County. Um, and we were recently, um, let me, Mount Calvert was a lot of things. Uh, it was an, an indigenous village for thousands and thousands of years. Um, it was the first uh, seat of government for Prince George's County when um, Prince George's broke away from Calvert County in the late 1600s, and then it became a tobacco plantation. And so the I, only... might, I might interrupt here that we're a day past Prince George's County's birthday, which happened at Mount Calvert, St. George's Day, 1696. April 23rd, the, really? Yep, St. George's Day, old calendar, Julian. More information, non-archeological. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. I just can't resist that kind of information. Yep. No, it was our great. birthday, 327 years, and we're still the county of sameness. Semperate, sorry. <laughs> I learned something. Um, Thank you. I did not know that. Um, so, so we're talking about what you discover about diet from animal remains and things yes. of that nature. Yes. So what I was going to say is we recently uh, completed or uh, wrapped up an excavation in the area where the um, enslaved people were quartered um, when it was a tobacco plantation. So we're talking about 1790 until until emancipation, until the until the Civil War. Uh, and, you know, as we were excavating um, in that area where the enslaved families were living, it was interesting because, you know, we're finding things that they're eating, domesticated animals that they were eating, as you'd expect on a, on a farm, cow and um, pig. But then there was also a lot of um, uh, things that they were clearly going and getting themselves you know, turtles from the river, fish bones, um, you know, uh, deer, 
So things that, you know, sort of showing that there is this agency that the enslaved people had, or, or you know, certainly the wherewithal and, and necessity, uh, certainly, um, to go out and to, um, to get their own food. So um, in addition to whatever rations they've been given. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, it, that's certainly one way that, um, that we can use the faunal record to understand how people were living in the past. I want to come back to Mount Calvert in a little more detail, but I have some general questions that come to mind. So as a historic preservation commissioner, um, I, I seem to be working with two archaeologists, which sometimes is hard to explain to the public why historic preservation, we're the people above ground mostly, have two archaeologists how many archaeologists does the park department have? We have two full-time archaeologists, uh, and we are now up to three part-time archaeologists in the office, so five of us total. So that sort of begs the question, because I get um, kind of no response, because people don't think of archaeology in Prince George's County and Mount Calvert, well, that's kind of an important part, but is there a lot of archaeology in Prince George's County? There is a lot of archaeology in Prince George's County, yes, for sure. And I will say that the five of us in my office all do sort of different things. So um, my job is I do a lot of public programming. So I do things like this. I talk to people about the work that we do. I design public programs. Um, at Mount Calvert specifically, like this summer, we have a ton of programming going on. We have an excavation series. You can come out and actually dig with us. We have lab days where you can come and process the artifacts. We also do guided hikes. We do guided walks of the property. I even do guided kayak tours where I take you around and show you archaeological sites from the water. Um, so that's a lot of what I do. Um, my boss, Kristen Monoperto, she's the other full-time archaeologist in the office. Um, she kind of oversees the whole operation, but she deals a lot with park management because in addition to Mount Calvert, we also manage Dinosaur Park. We manage a park called Northampton Slave Quarter on Plantation. That's in Lake Arbor and the Bowie area of the county. We manage um, a Cherry Hill Cemetery, which is a postbellum 1880s to early 1900s African-American cemetery uh, near Riverdale Park. Um, and then, of course, we also ha have all of the artifacts from that have been collected, not only from those sites, but from all of the sites throughout Prince George's County. So in our archaeological collect in our archaeological lab and collections facility, we manage more than a million artifacts. So one where, of our archaeologists, go ahead. Where is this lab, said the guy that didn't know you had a lab? <laughs> Should come over sometime. Uh, it's in Upper Marlboro. It's really close to Mount Calvert. We're right down the road from Mount Calvert. No kidding. Yep. Wow. So you're not shipping everything down there to Calvert County to Patterson. We're no, actually as, as we on talked to about, those. yeah, John Peter, we are not with Calvert County anymore, right? Prince George's and Calvert broke away many moons ago, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of back in the past. Well, yes, so I'm going to have to look into this. Uh, I didn't know you had a lab. Is it open to the public? It is, yeah, we take volunteers there. We have a volunteer program where people can come and help us process the artifacts. Um, and then we curate them there as well. So it's climate mm -hmm. controlled. And one of our archeologists, uh, uh, Sean Jones, he's our collections manager. So he oversees all of those collections and also oversees the lab as well. So when artifacts come in dirty from the field, he processes them and makes sure that they get cataloged and um, you know up to, curation standards. Um, we have another archaeologist in the office. Her name is Exa Grubb. Her specialty is GIS, Geographic Information System Mapping. So we do a lot of compliance too. So if there's ever something that's happening on a park, uh, like um, to a historic site, especially like if they're putting in a new fiber optic line, or maybe they're putting in a new patio or some sort of development, the archaeology team gets involved. And what Exa will do is go back through historic maps See if there's anything that could maybe jump out, like maybe there's do, um, you know, maybe we don't care about this new fiber optic line going through the side of the property because it used to be a parking lot or a swimming pool and we know it's disturbed. Or maybe she'll 
or if you know they're putting in a new ball field somewhere, she'll sit in on those meetings and say, this property has really high potential for archaeological sites. And she'll work with the planning team to, um, as they're making their way through the, the, co the compliance process. Well, um, I'm glad to hear that as chair of the Historic Preservation Commission, because we don't look likely on people digging in historic designated properties. <laughs> we we take um, uh, we, we are very concerned anytime somebody sticks a shovel into a historic property. Um, I I want to go back to Mount Calvert a little bit and and try to understand a little more. I have this picture of archaeologists. So you well first you have to decide where to dig. And perhaps you can talk a little bit about that. Then I'm going to ask you, so once you decide to dig, then what? Do you kind of pile the soil up and hope you find something? But I'll take you step by step through my question. So how do you know where to dig? There are several ways that an archaeologist knows where to dig. Um, the first way, you know, for a long time, I, I used to work in the private sector. So... Um, I worked on the in compliance archaeology all the time. And a developer would hire my firm and give us a map and say, this is where my townhouse development is going to go. And in that case, it was easy to figure out where to dig because we just dig where the townhouses are going to go. So if someone says this area is going to be disturbed, then we will dig in that area. Um, another way we might know where to dig is if we've done some kind of survey. So we can either do a shovel test survey where we're digging a lot of holes across a, a, a landscape in a kind of a grid pattern. And then if we find a concentration of artifacts or, um, you know, the soil's a different color, we find a lot of bricks or whatever, then maybe we can say, okay, maybe there was a settlement in this area. And so from that small hole, then we'd start expanding out. Or another type of survey we could do is like a remote sensing where we could hire, we don't do this in our office, but we could hire a, a crew to come out and do like um, magnetometer survey or ground penetrating radar. And then they might see some anomalies in their maps and say, there's something weird going on here. It looks like there might be a, some kind of, there might be, have been fires burned here, a hearth, there might've been a foundation or something. And so that's where we'll, we'll hone in. Sometimes it's also surface collecting. If we're in a plowed field and we see a lot of artifacts in one area, they don't tend to move so much by the plow. So it's like, okay, there must have been some sort of settlement here. So that, that'll also pinpoint us where to dig. So at Mount Calvert, and for those of our listeners who don't know it, if you were to go out there today, it looks like fields, uh, open fields with some woods and a beautiful river kind of making a bend around it. There's a solitary brick building located. I know that uh, you mentioned that it was once the county seat, so you had some kind of idea where some of the buildings would be, but recently we've been trying to tell the rest of the story, the enslaved population. How did you go about deciding where to even do a survey to begin looking for where enslaved people might have uh, lived? in the time when Mount Calvin was a kind of little hamlet town county seat? So the quarters area I was talking about earlier is after the town period. That's related to the brick mansion, the plantation. But really, in both cases, it was kind of we found these, we decided where to dig in, in much the same way. It was a lot of surface collection. So whenever the park when the commission bought Mount Calvert back in the 90s, it was still being plowed. It was still being actively plowed. So after the, all the fields were plowed, the archeologists went out and they collected artifacts from the field, but they separated all of Mount Calvert, all the fields you see today into arbitrary grids, 10 foot grids. And so then they would collect everything from these little 10 foot grids and then they put that on a distribution map and started to say, well, there's a whole bunch of colonial artifacts over here. There's a whole bunch of artifacts from the 1830s over there. Um, so that started to get us to figure out 
where these historic settlements were. Now, I should say that when it comes to the indigenous artifacts, the, the artifacts, you know, from before European colonization, they are everywhere, everywhere yeah. across this property. So narrowing down where those settlements were is even more complicated, but that's a much, much longer period of time we're talking about, like thousands and thousands of years as opposed to hundreds. Sure. So then, and in this case, so then in both of those cases, we 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 coupled the results from the surface collection with ground penetrating radar surveys, which helped us to further figure out where those colonial buildings were versus the um the quarters for the enslaved families in the 1820s, 30s, 40s. It's based uh -huh. on the types of artifacts we find. You know, we can date them to to very tight time periods. So so now you've you've identified um, an area and now you well, you dig more than a hole. I'm assuming it's sort of like a trench or something. But do you just go in and with a shovel and scoop things up? I mean, I know it's more than that, but maybe at, at a high level, describe how you you can't possibly be just scooping soil up. There must be some kind of process to this. I or am just it? scooping soil up, really. That is, all, <laughs> that is all I do, especially in Mount Calvert when, so, okay, if I'm in the top, the top layer, if I'm in the plow zone, we call this, this area, you know, that, so like, let's talk about the quarters for the enslaved families, right? Like they're torn down around 1870, probably not long after the Civil War. And then it goes back to farm fields. And for the next 140, 50 years, whatever, it's plowed. The plow is out there churning the soil. So in that top foot of soil, I am using nothing more than a shovel to go in there. Maybe I'll be digging a round hole. Maybe I'm digging a square hole. It depends on what type of survey or type of work we're doing. But yes, that is all I'm doing. And as I talked about public programming, the plow zone archaeology is great for to bring the public in because I can get a nine-year-old or a 90-year-old, if she wants, <laughs> out there with a shovel, and they're not going to hurt this archaeology at all. They Because all they're doing is just digging it out. You put it into a bucket. That bucket goes into a screen. The screen is sort of like, imagine like a box, and on the bottom it has um, one quarter inch hard wire mesh, and you shake it back and forth till you get all the loose soil out. You push the rest of the soil through, and then you pick through and look for the artifacts, and all the artifacts that, you know, you separate the rocks, because we don't really want the rocks, unless they're fossils or something, like they rarely are. Um, and then, yeah, and then all the artifacts go into a bag and that bag comes back to the office with us. So yes, but if I'm, like we recently did a dig at Mount Calvert where we're digging right around the house. So we are right next to the house. The reason we're digging there is for compliance because they are doing um, uh, restorations on the Mount Calvert mansion. There's been some water infiltration. And so we have to dig the whole way down to the bottom of this five foot foundation on the exterior of the house when we're in the top it's, it's a lot of fill dirt you know they the guys who lived there in the 20th century they were putting fill all around the house to like level the yard and everything once I get down past that it, it's pretty fascinating because you only have to get like a foot I'm not exaggerating when I say one foot away from the house and you get into these levels you're only maybe two feet down it's it's the living surface that the indigenous people were walking on a thousand years ago the soil is like dark and rich and organic from all the food that they were eating, all the fires that they were burning. And when I get down to those levels that still have oyster shell and mussel shell and, and, and turtle shell in it, then I'm starting to use a trowel and I'm going at a much slower pace. But I'm still just taking that soil out and putting it into a bucket and you're screening it over there while I'm continuing to dig. Aha. Uh -huh. So... The soil is filtered. The the artifacts are collected. I, they're marked somehow, and now the the bag, the collection from that particular dig, goes to your lab. Is that the next step? Yes, exactly. So all of those artifacts come to the lab, and this is another part we do with the public. Uh, 
extensively. Uh, we wash the artifacts. All of the artifacts have to be washed with a toothbrush. It's just a toothbrush and water. That's it. <laughs> and so each and every one of those artifacts is scrubbed off. All the dirt is scrubbed off. Some are dry brushed, like metal or leather or something we'll, we won't put into water. We'll just use a, a dry toothbrush to get the, the soil off. Excuse me. Um, and yeah, so then all of those artifacts, they dry completely. The wet artifacts dry completely. And then <clears throat> we sort them into different types of artifacts. So all the glass will go in one pile, the pottery will go in another, the indigenous pottery will go in another, tobacco pipes go in another pile. So all of these, and then all those different piles, we put them into um, acid-free bags with acid-free tags and acid-free boxes so that they can live in our collections facility for as long as possible. And then we're also cataloging as we go. So all, all the artifacts are cataloged and that catalog goes into a database. And then that's when we can start analyzing the assemblage as well. So it's at the, the analyzing stage. I guess that's where I think of archeology. span So at that point, expertise and professionalism says, this is a 18th century piece of glass. This is a 20th century piece of glass. And you kind of know this because that's part of the profession. And if you don't know it, it gets set aside for other experts to take a gander at and try to figure out where it came from. Is that sort of what's going on when you say analyze? Yeah, so, we, so that's the cataloging stage. It's just identifying each of those artifacts. The analyzing stage is, one of my favorite parts of the whole process is where you get to kind of roll your sleeves up and get there into the data. So you're looking at like, as you know, archaeology is like a layer cake, right? So we're going down through the soil horizons layer by layer. So I can look at what's going on in layer A and say all of these artifacts date to maybe, let's say, the 19th or 20th century. I get into layer B and they may be there, you know, the 18th and 17th century. And then as we go down, the artifacts will be getting older and older. One would hope. Not all right. the have been disturbed, but, um, but then you can also take the artifacts from those layers and compare it to what's happening to other parts of your site. So maybe I'll say, well, what's happening on the other side of the house? How does, how does layer D here compare to layer D over there? Well, they're different. So now we can start to understand, well, what they were doing on this side of the house a thousand years ago is different than what they were doing over there a thousand years ago. Of course, in an absence of the house at that point. How does that, those levels of artifacts, those collections of artifacts differ from what's happening a thousand feet away out in the field where we know there was a settlement from 2000 years ago? How does all of that compare to what's going on across the river in Anne Arundel County at other indigenous sites that we've excavated, that I've excavated and, you know, other archaeologists have excavated? How does that compare to what's happening, you know, in St. Mary's County at other indigenous sites? How does our artifacts compare to what's happening there? So now you can start to think bigger picture. And that's where you really start to get a sense of what's happening with a culture for which we have nothing written, um, but we have all of these material remains. And that's where we can start to, to really understand what was happening in the past. How, how many, my mind is going all over the place here. Do you know offhand how many sites the Parks Department um, manages that have indigenous people settlements or evidence thereof? So I think we're up to somewhere around 250 archaeological sites just on park property in Prince George's County. I think that there's somewhere in the range of 1,300 sites that have been recorded in Prince George's County total. Um, in the entire state, I think it's closer to 15,000 archaeological sites have been recorded. Well, now, I'm going to stay focused on Prince George's because those are <laughs> huge numbers alone just for Prince George's County. It is. Um, it is. And I would bet to answer your question, how many of those have indigenous components just in Prince George's County? I'd say at least 75% or better. Are these, um, so I know from my uh, commission work that we are sensitive to 
generally talking about archaeological sites. It's not like it's classified information, but we don't put big signs up and says, X marks the spot where you can come out and do archaeology yourself because we're not around. What about the catalogs? I mean, at what point does a researcher or a historian um, be able, is able to access this cataloging and analysis? Where does that happen? Or even an interested lay public? Any researcher can ask for our catalogs and we will happily provide them. The trend in archaeology, especially public facing archaeology, the type that we do on public lands, is to have open access catalogs. That's something that we are aspiring for. We haven't done that. So in that case, the entire assemblage for the site is online and any cat, any researcher can use it. Oh. Um, what, but, so that's something, like I said, we're aspiring for. We haven't done that yet, but by all means, if you, anyone wants to see the data, we're happy to share it with you because that's just contributing to the broader understanding of, of history. Right, but uh, so this is great information. On the other hand, you're not encouraging people to come out with their metal detectors by the light of the full moon to do their own archaeology. I'd say I'm actively discouraging that even. <laughs> yes. Uh, so on park property, it is illegal to collect uh, any fossil or artifact. Um, you know, we were talking about how it's Maryland Archaeology Month, and the subject of Maryland Archaeology Month is all about context. And um, this was really sort of an archaeological attempt to push back against a narrative that I think is becoming increasingly accepted that, like, you don't need a degree, you don't need any, you know, training to go out and dig. Anybody can go out and dig and should go out and dig. And especially during the pandemic, this was something kind of fun that families would do together. You can go outside and you're socially distanced and let's dig that old farm that's in the backyard or on grandma's property or whatever. But the truth is, is when you're doing that, I mean, from, from, a, from an archeologist, knowing precisely where everything comes from is so much more important than finding that really cool artifact. And I, I, I want to be clear that, like, I think most archaeologists do get into this field because we want to see those cool things. We want to find them. But knowing where they come from is so much more important. We're talking about, like, the bags of artifacts that we take back to the lab. You know, all of those have the precise context information from where that came at Mount Calvert, because that's what's meaningful. You know, a couple of years ago, I was contacted by someone over on the eastern shore that had a collection of cigar boxes and coffee cans that were full of artifacts that said Mount Calvert on them. And he's like, do you want them? So I went over there to the Eastern shore to look at them and they were neat artifacts. You know, they're Indian stone tools and Indian pottery and, you know, they're tobacco pipes. But I'm like, honestly, I don't know if this came from Mount Calvert or if it didn't. And even if it did, where did it come from Mount Calvert? That's what's meaningful to me. So when you take something out of its context, it loses a lot of meaning. That's so much of that story is gone. It's like finding a puzzle piece that's on the ground. Where's the rest of the puzzle? It's, it doesn't mean as much. Well, that's the same problem in, in narrative history when you start abstracting the really cool and interesting from the context of the whole story, you can get wildly off track. Yes. Um, Yes. So in, in some sense, narrative historians and archaeologists are doing the same thing. And I, I think narrative historians need the, uh, we need you, <laughs> the archaeologists. You're, you kind of build a foundation for us to begin to weave a story. Um, I want to go back to Mount Calvert. So how much of the site, is there more to dig out there? I mean, it's a how how big is Mount Calvert? Let's start with that. Uh, the prop, the part part that we own now is seventy six acres, about. Uh, and so yes, there plenty is of room to do. <laughs> oh my gosh, so much to do. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, you know, 
well, like I said, the last few years we've been digging around the house because that work that has to be done in advance of all this restoration work. Um, one thing I'm really interested in doing is going back into the unsurveyed parts of Mount Calvert, the parts that are like in the back of the property and the forested areas, um, because we've gone back there and do little surface collections and we find little bits of artifacts like coming out of, you know, tree roots and little banks and that kind of thing. Um, but I'd love to go back there and, and, and discover um, parts that have never been collected or, you know, treated at all. And so I'm hoping to do some of that uh, this summer when we have our, um, our public dig. Uh, we might end up back around the house. I'm not sure. It sort of remains to be seen exactly the, the speed at which this restoration work begins. Oh, I guess I should ask the question. So do you have an expected finish time for the the archaeology around the house so that the restoration can commence and be finished? No, um, but what I will tell you, we are actually hiring an outside archaeological firm to help us with the work because ah. it's going to be quite extensive. You know, just in the few public digs that we've done, we have found thousands of artifacts dating back. I think our earliest artifact was like an 8,000 year old stone tool that was found about four feet down right next to the house. So, um, so, and we're still processing those artifacts. So we, uh, we've worked with the planners to work it into the budget so that we can hire an outside consulting firm who can come and help us do the excavation and also the processing and analysis, which is, like I said, also really important. So can no, you, but. Can I, you I tell me, can you tell me a little bit about how the public reaches you or how does it get involved in the public participation part of the work you're doing out there? There's a couple ways to do that. Um, and Adam, I see your, uh, your question in the chat. So I kind of answer that um, as well. How does the public find out when they can come and help do digs and help with the artifacts? The first way is just to sign up as a volunteer because we are always looking for volunteers in our lab to come. We have several volunteer days uh, every month, but honestly, we sign. We do that because we we offer um, service learning credit to um, to the high school kids who need to get some their volunteer time, so they can come and help volunteer. They can process artifacts and get their volunteer hours. Um, but especially for our adult volunteers, if there's a day that you want to come out, then we are more than happy to open up the lab and you can come and and you know you start out with just doing basic artifact processing, washing, rebagging, that sort of thing. Uh, but then some people are really interested in, you know, like um, learning how to catalog. And so we'll teach you how to do that. Or, um, you know, we have a ton of like old maps and um, records in the office that need to be scanned and digitally sorted. So we've had and like old slides from like the 70s and 80s. And so all that needs to be scanned as well. So we've had some people that really, really enjoy doing that. So that's the first way of volunteering. Second way is just sign up for any of our public programs and you can find those by going to pgparks.com. And I think you click on the link that says like register for a class um, or it's like sign up for a program or something like that. That takes you to the site where all of our archeology span programs are listed and just type archeology span in the, in the search bar and you'll find all of our programs. I don't think our summer programs are up there yet. All of our spring ones are there. I hesitate to ask, but I heard digitizing old maps. What's the plan for the old maps after digitization? That's a great question. Yeah, first of all, just knowing what we have is important because, you know, archaeologists, we're kind of, we're a little bit like hoarders a little bit. So like, <laughs> You know, we keep a lot of stuff over the years. So we have files and records and there were some, uh, there's like one I'm thinking of, somebody did a, a study, uh, this must've been, I would guess the seventies or eighties where they were trying to figure out like land holdings, 17th century land holdings for like a big portion of Southern Prince George's County. And so all of the maps that they produced with the names and like, you know, the dates, <clears throat> the patent dates for when they, these people were getting the land in the 17th century, this is at the office. And like, you know, our, our exa grub, who's our, our GIS and our tech, our tech guru, 
um, she went through and she's at least made a, a, a list of all of these things. Now actually scanning them and also getting like a big scanner where we can scan them, digitize them, and then do something like we're talking like with open access to make that available to researchers is something that we'd like to do. I, I just ask because I have an interest in making sure that old maps don't wind up shredded. Um, a, 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 I'll probably talk to you offline. <laughs> um, okay, so back to archaeology. Uh, we talked about the method of collection, the content, uh, moving things to the lab that I, for one, didn't know there was one. Um, and then the importance of context. We've talked about the public getting involved. How important is public involvement? Very, very important. You know, um, for several reasons. You know, first of all, I think, I feel like when you get to touch an artifact, when you're the one that's discovered it, um, or when you're in, even in the lab and you're processing it, and you know that you're one of the first people to touch this object, you know, that maybe no one has touched in hundreds or thousands of years. It provides this tangible connection to the past that I don't think can be easily replicated. Um, and even if you're not even particularly interested in history and it's not totally your thing, you know, there's still something meaningful about that. Um, and then on top of that, to like start those conversations, you know, archaeology can be, um, you know, it can be a way to open up a discussion that maybe you weren't ready to have. Like when we were digging in the quarters area, um, you know, I had several, I did, we did like Boy Scout groups and homeschool groups and, you know, groups of like kids. And I would be out there talking about just very frankly about, you know, the enslaved people and, you know, what their lives were like. And, you know, I had several kids that were like, can you say, what is slavery? And I'm like, okay, let's go there. So, you know, now not only can I start a conversation with a kid about what slavery was, maybe I can start to talk about its lasting ramifications into today's world. But on top of that, now they have this connection because they can be touching a and examining, you know, a button from an enslaved person's shirt or a, a fragment of a dish that maybe they ate off of. Um, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, in that case, I think it's really important. And, you know, and it's archaeology can be a real community building thing. I, I have to say, like, really, when you're out on a dig with a bunch of people for a couple of days, like suddenly, they're like your family, you know, when you're all out there, like, just, you know, getting dirty together and, you know, discovering history or, or really even in the lab as well. So, um, so yeah, I mean, allowing the allowing the public inviting the public to come into the process at all stages also with descendants you know to to we which is something that you know we're we have not done much of at mount calvert but a lot of our parks have done you know we're reaching out to descendant communities okay. and um and bringing them into the process as well like and then getting their stories you know we found maybe we found these artifacts over here and in this old foundation. What do you remember about that? What did your grandmother tell you about that? Or what stories were passed down? That helps with the interpretation as well. And, um, you know, and, and, and with that, with making connections all across the board. Um, I, I'm going to get specific again, um, because as you were talking about the importance of the public, it just occurred to me another thing I don't know about Mount Calvert. Are there any burial sites on the park's property of Mount Calvert? No, we've never found any human burials at Mount Calvert. There is one burial we did find at Mount Calvert. It's a dog. They found an, an indigenous dog burial. It must be at least 700 years old, maybe up to at least a thousand years old. Um, Mike Lucas, uh, he was um, in, in my job before, before me, uh, Mike was monitoring as they were putting in a new septic system at Mount Calvert back in the late 90s. And he had actually dug holes all along the proposed path of the septic 
but then he, he found stuff. He, I said, you know, we have the indigenous living surface that you get down to after a, a, a couple of feet out there around the house. But he was watching the backhoe as they're digging the rest of the trench and the backhoe uncovered a dog burial, a full dog, um, which is really rare in the middle Atlantic. Um, you know, uh, dogs uh, for, for native people, they were um, uh, companions. Um, they were used as um, for work animals. They were sometimes food. Uh, but this guy must have been pretty special because he was clearly buried right in the in the village. So that's the only burial that we have at Mount Calvert. I suppose the um, so that's actually fascinating because um, I hadn't thought about that. I was thinking of the enslaved people in the 19th century, um, where they would have been buried. But I suppose that's for more archaeology in the future? Um, it's a great question. And I would love to know that the answer to that. Um, it certainly could have been on the property. Of course, you know, the problem when we're dealing with, you know, African American burials from the, or really burials of anybody, you know, who's, um, you know, a, you know, a, a poor population. Um, when we're talking about, you know, various for enslaved people or tenants, they're not, they don't have headstones. You know, they don't have anything that really lasts. So, you know, if, if you're lucky if they have head and footstones, but of course, you know, rocks are somewhat hard to come by in the coastal plain. So, um, so maybe you just have some kind of vegetation. You might have like yucca or maybe you have some other kind of cultivar that's planted there, but then you fast forward a few generations and everybody sort of forgot where these burials were. So um, it, it, they can be very hard to find. So, wow, I'm learning so much here. So here goes me being the, I thought archeologist dug for bones. How long does a, um, the soil and the climate do human bones or just animal bones? Uh, remain identifiable in, in the sort of surface level kind of conditions? Well, it depends very much on the type of soil that the person or the animal is buried in or the bone is sitting in. Um, that dog is in great shape after a thousand years because the soil that he was buried in or she, I'm not sure, uh, was, um, uh, is, is rich, it's organic, it has, it has a lot of charcoal in it, it has a lot of um, shell in it, it makes it more basic, because the uh -huh. soil in this area is very acidic, so if you just dig a hole, you know, somewhere at Mount Calvert, like in the top, you know, a couple feet of soil, then that, those bones are probably going to break down a whole lot quicker, than um, than something that's in soil that has a lot of um, uh, things like charcoal and, and shell to, to to change the pH of it. So it, the short answer is it depends. I mean, think about like bog bodies. Maybe you've heard about these bog bodies in Europe where like, you know, people are like coming out of bogs after like 5,000 years and you can still see their hair, uh, you know, or conversely, they're in the desert and, you know, you have the same kind of preservation happening. Um, so so a bog, um, aren't bogs acidic? I think it's just there's so much peat there that, and like they get kind of like compressed with all of the um, uh, the organics uh -huh. again that are sort of like compressing you and keeping you in there. Um, which is really probably the same reason that my, um, we were able to bring it back to the top to my dinosaur bone that I excavated after 115 million years. That guy lived in the swamp. That's where he died, and that's why his bone is still sitting there for us to find. Right, right. So I hadn't thought about. I'm, a, I'm an, my my background is horticulture, and I should have known the answer to my question: the acidic nature of our top layers of soil here in the Mid Atlantic would not react well to bone and the acidic nature. I guess I could have answered my own question if I'd actually thought about it a little bit. Um, yeah, so, I think about it differently. So I'll let you have one more, John Peter, and then we'll go to 
Oh, public no. questions. One more. Uh, One more. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 so, 20th, 20th century finds, when do 20th century finds become important to wind up at the lab? Is there a cutoff date? Yeah, we say 50 years is kind of the cutoff date, but really if there was something that was really interesting in the last 50 years, you know, and we, you know, wanted to excavate it, then, then we certainly could. Um, you know, at Mount Calvert, um, we have a station for the Chesapeake Beach Railway, uh, which went from Washington, D.C. to Chesapeake Beach. And so it would be across the Tuxet, right, at, uh, at Mount Calvert. And uh, so, yeah, you know, if I knew precisely where the rail station was there and we could do some excavations, I think we have a pretty good idea of where it was. But, um, you know, that's that went kaput what, in like the 1930s or so. So that would be very interesting to, to find. Um, I did an excavation once at a Negro League baseball field from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, um, which wasn't terribly fascinating. It was really what you expected a baseball field. It was like beer bottles and, you know, like oyster shells and like things that people are eating and drinking and that kind of thing. But, you know, that certainly went back to the lab. So. All right. Well, I, I'm... Uh can't believe I've run out of time. So uh, Madam President Donna, if you want to open up okay. for questions, I'll try to keep my piece over here. Sure. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> so Adam Cantor had another question. Has there been any ar underwater archeology span projects done around the waters of Mount Calvert? Yes, there was an underwater dig that happened about a mile up from Mount Calvert. Uh, back, uh, it was a War of 1812 shipwreck. It's Barney's flotilla from uh, from the War of 1812. So archaeologists, underwater archaeologists, figure out where Barney, Commodore Joshua Barney, had to scuttle his his ship, his entire fleet. He blew them to smithereens because he was getting chased and got caught up the Patuxet, you know, when he was getting chased by the British. So yes, yeah, so the underwater archaeologist um, did some excavation up there, and the Navy owns it and still does go out yearly and will do um, like sonar surveys and radar surveys to to see if they can uh, determine um, the, the where the rest of the fleet is because the archaeologists only found so much. You can only see about like you know six inches in front of your face in the Patuxet. It's not the clearest conditions by any means. Okay. Um, Oscar Gregory asked, would there be a way for interested parties to access Maryland Archaeological Site Survey Form, such as 18 PR 620? Um, yes, you could. So, um, you know, you could contact me and, you know, if you, there's a reason that you're interested, I could probably share it with you. Um, typically, the state of Maryland holds the the map locations for all of the um, uh, the sites. Um, they keep it protected for looting purposes, so that someone doesn't go out and say, "Oh, this looks like a cool site. I'm going to go dig it." Um, if it comes to just being interested in like what was found there, then that's kind of a different different type of um, question. But but yeah, I could probably share that with you. Please feel free to get in touch with me. I can talk to you more. Okay, Oscar, I can I can forward you Stephanie's email so you can reach out to her. Um, at the moment, that's all the questions, unless somebody else has another question or John Peter, if you have something else you want to ask. How, how are we doing on time? We got six minutes. Um, okay, so I want to sort of pursue you, you, the this uh, 20th century question because historic preservation has the same fuzzy 50-year moving delineation. And it, it seems to me, especially with archaeology and even history, we sometimes, um, and I know it's a cost thing, we tend to put into our curtain midden pile <laughs> things that perhaps we ought to be saving uh, because they're new. And, and I'm just wondering, 
about archaeology and this sort of fuzzy date when we run into a midden pile and I hear, well, it just had 20th century stuff in it. And then that's, Jennifer, if you're listening, I'm not aiming that at you. <laughs> um, um, and I've always wondered, wouldn't we, if we're already doing the archaeology, why would we catalog that stuff under the OG oh, whiz? Maybe in another 50 years, somebody might think this useful. Yeah, for sure. And I think it really it depends on like what the situation is. You know, if I'm at Mount Calvert and I'm digging through the hill horizons that um, are all around the house and it's filled with plastic and, you know, styrofoam or something or like, you know, the trash that the contractors left in like the 90s when they were doing the work there, they're like coffee cup whatever like I don't I'm okay with just recording that and, and pitching it um you know if I'm digging like a tenant house from the 1920s 30s even 40s or so and I want to find out like more about the lives of of that family then yeah for sure I'll, I'm going to be keeping virtually everything it also really comes down to like a collections issue that you know we were talking about our collections facility that we have and we're running out of room so we sometimes have to be very careful about what it is we um, we save and what we hang on to. You know, recently I did a um, a small survey at the Surratt House Museum down in Clinton, and uh, we were digging around their research center there, and it was all 20th century stuff. So what we and it was all disturbed. It was all fell horizons. So what we did though was we recorded all of it. We cataloged all of that. Now we have the data, but we discarded the artifacts because it was all just kind of tiny bits of glass and plastic and that sort of thing. So we have the record of what we found. We just don't have to hang on to the stuff that we found. Right. Well, that that at least addresses part of. Um, I I just I always put myself in the year twenty one twenty three. We might be in context wanting to know, so what was all of this styrofoam and plastic about? Um, and if we don't record what we were doing now, but anyway, I-, I it's, We have two more questions. So let me, okay. So Oscar asked another question, where is a good place to find cost proposals to restore an old African-American cemetery? There are grants out there increasingly. Um, like the state of Maryland has a brand new grant program specifically focused on African American history. So well, the Maryland Historic Trust. Yeah. So that would be a great place to start. And when it comes to cost proposals, oh gosh, I'm not sure. That might be a Jennifer Stabler question. John Peters mentioned her name a couple of times and she has done a ton of work and also knows like contractors as well who might um who might be able to give you cost proposals and then um, he has a continuation would the maryland historical trust be a good place to archive those old maps and would the maps be available to the public the maps will certainly be available to the public that is my hope once they're scanned and digitized would it be, would MHT want them? Probably not. They'd probably be like, keep your own stuff, you know, just like give us the digital files. Um, <laughs> but we have the room. So, you know, we're happy to uh, to hang on to them, but keeping that digital record and and bringing it up into the um, the 21st century is, is key. And I see you want to volunteer to scan and you are welcome to. We would eagerly <laughs> uh, accept you into, into the lab. So um, please send me an email and let's talk more because um, because we could really use the help. Okay, well, I think that'll be the last. <laughs> he said Prince George's Historical Society, which is us, um, yeah, is fun. first though. <laughs> <laughs> um, 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 so. I, Donna, before we no. hang, hang up or adjourn, whatever it is, uh, Stephanie, I wanna thank you very much for this. And I will be pinging Jennifer about a field trip to this lab that 
I seem to not know existed. So I, I will somehow find my way to the lab. You are welcome anytime. We will, we're happy to show you around. Let me know, I might wanna tag along. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all right, well, thank you, Stephanie and John Peter. It was a very interesting chat again this evening. Um, and as always, we appreciate our members joining us and welcome new friends to our history chats. The Society is an all-volunteer organization that is supported by members, sponsors, and donations. If you enjoyed tonight's chat and aren't already a member, please consider becoming one or making a donation, which can be done through our website, so we can continue to offer things like the History Chat at, at no cost. Our next History Chat is going to be Monday, May 22nd, where we will celebrate the County's Historic Preservation Month with the owner of Claggett House at Cool Spring Manor. He will be discussing his efforts in restoring this historic home. So we hope you can join us. So that's all for this evening. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, thanks for having me. Thank you. Now to stop the recording. <laughs>